Hi, St. Mark's. Last week, I started talking specifically about English hymns, Anglican hymns, and most specifically, Anglican metrical psalmody, which is the basis for our hymns today that we sing in the church. Uh, I started with the Reformation and went all the way to the settlement of the New World and the founding of the Protestant Episcopal Church in the United States. This week, I'll shift back to England and begin essentially where I left off after the publication of the new version of the Psalter published by Tate and Brady, which is a replacement of the old version by Sternhold and Hopkins. This week, we start with the infamous hymn writer named Isaac Watts. He was born in 1674 and died in 1748. Isaac Watts grew up with the old and new versions of the Psalters, but somehow found them lacking. He groaned to his parents, and they encouraged him to do something better, to stop complaining and write his own. So he did. In 1707, he published two collections of his hymns, including several metrical hymn psalm texts. In 1709, he published a second edition of his hymnal, or his collection of congregational music more specifically. And the metrical psalm texts were removed from this collection because he had planned to write a complete metrical psalter of his own. As he put it, he was going to convert the biggest part of this book of psalms into spiritual songs for the use of Christians. In July of 1712, Joseph Addison began to include metrical versions of the Psalms in Saturday editions of The Spectator. The Spectator was a daily publication. It is not the same publication by the same name published in Britain today. Hymn 409 in our hymnal is one example of a, one of Addison's Psalms. It's paired with the tune by Franz Josef Haydn from his oratorio called The Creation. Here's hymn 409. Such a happy tune, it's great. Addison's metrical psalm texts became highly influential and were included in books by John Wesley, as well as appendices to the newer editions of the new version of the Psalter. Isaac Watts set his own version of Psalm 114 and sent it into the spectator to be included. It appeared on Saturday, August 23rd, 1712. Seven years later, in 1719, Isaac Watts finally completed the, his translation of all 150 psalms. It was called, The Psalms of David Imitated in the Language of the New Testament and Applied to the Christian State of Worship. Watts had an obsession with Christianizing the psalms. His phrase that he uses in the title, imitated in the language of the New Testament, stands in contrast to conferred with the Hebrew from the old version of Sternhold and Hopkins. Both the old and new versions of the Psalter attempted to remain faithful to the original meaning of the texts in Hebrew. Watts, rather, attempted to translate the Psalms through the lens of the New Testament. Watts made repeated attempts to Christianize David or to express similar sentiments from David's words in the Psalms using English Christian vocabulary. As Watts says himself, I have not been so curious and exact in striving everywhere to express the ancient sense and meaning of David but have rather expressed myself as I may suppose David would have done had he lived in the days of Christianity. Now, Watts was not being exactly revolutionary in trying to Christianize the Psalms. 
As Laura West pointed out in the Meter and Hymns video, Martin Luther did the same thing in his hymn, A Mighty Fortress. This is hymn 688. In verse 2, he mentions Christ Jesus, it is he. But of course, Christ Jesus had yet to be born in human flesh. Nevertheless, Luther decided to Christianize the phrase, the Lord of hosts is with us, the God of Jacob is our stronghold, by inserting Jesus into that portion of the psalm. Watts' critics were enraged because Watts' translation seemed to call into question the authority of Scripture. Traditionalist Anglicans were more in favor of the old and new versions rather than Watts's, because in their view, these texts were more faithful to the Bible. Watts was also a member of the Independents, who rejected both Episcopal and Presbyterian political structures. By Episcopal, I mean those who are ruled by bishops, and by Presbyterian, I mean those who are ruled by presbyters or pastors. The Independents that Watts belonged to eventually became known as Congregationalists. Traditionalist Anglicans felt that they were unable to sing psalms written by anyone other than traditionalist Anglicans because they would be theologically suspect. Eventually, though, Watts's texts made their way into Anglican hymnals. John Wesley included 13 of Watts's psalms in his collections of psalms and hymns, published in 1737. Other Anglican editors included Watts's texts without attaching his names to the texts. That famous anonymous struck again. The hymnal 1982 includes eight of Isaac Watts's metrical psalms. I'll play three for you. The first is hymn number 680, O God, Our Help in Ages Past, which is a paraphrase of Psalm 90. I played the whole thing because the piece at the end of the video will be based on this hymn. Another example of Isaac Watts' metrical psalm texts is hymn number 664, My Shepherd Will Supply My Need, which is a metrical setting of Psalm 23. And perhaps for Americans today, the most famous of Isaac Watts's metrical psalms is his setting of Psalm 98, which is hymn 100. I'm not even going to tell you the title because I'm sure you'll know it. Joy to the world. Of course you know that one. Isaac Watts may have begun his career writing these metrical psalm texts. However, he felt that this was fairly limiting and that Christians should sing all of the words of Scripture. This was a radical shift in some ways. And in the early 19th century, this shift created a flood of Christian hymnody and had replaced the monolithic tradition of English metrical psalmody. This does not mean that the English churches threw out the psalms completely. Anglicans continued with the old and new versions of the psalms. Independents adopted Watts' psalm versions. Hymn writers continued to be inspired to, by the psalms, writing newer versions. And Charles Wesley produced several hymn and psalm collections including nearly all of the psalms for his Methodist followers in 1740s. Not all Anglican evangelicals accepted Watts's translations. 
William Romaine much preferred the old version for its scriptural accuracy. He called Watts's translation, Watts's whims. In fact, William Romaine wrote a scathing criticism of Watts's whims, as he put it. He writes, my concern is to see Christian congregations shut out divinely inspired psalms and take Dr. Watts's flights of fancy, as if the words of a poet were better than the words of a prophet, or as if the wit of a man was to be preferred to the wisdom of God. Why should Dr. Watts or any hymn maker not only take precedence of the Holy Ghost, but also thrust him entirely out of the church? Mainstream Anglicans would tend to agree with Romaine's criticism and favor both the new and old version of the Psalms rather than adopting Watts's texts. As I mentioned last week, when the Protestant Episcopal Church in the United States was formed in 1789, the new version of the Psalter by Tate and Brady became the standard for us here in the US. However, American Presbyterians were facing a controversy over which Psalter to use in their churches. In the 1730s and 1740s, the Great Awakening was happening in the Eastern United States. At this time, many emphasized secular rationalism over religion. In an attempt to revitalize religious fervor, preachers would travel from town to town preaching about the gospel emphasizing salvation from sins and promoting a renewed Christian identity. Jonathan Edwards and George Whitefield are two examples of preachers from this movement. The Presbyterians divided into two camps. The old side Presbyterians adhered to the Commonwealth Psalters of Rue or Barton. New side Presbyterians chose either the new version or Watts. Eventually, the new side prevailed and Watts's Psalter was adopted. It was altered to reflect new political realities following the Revolutionary War, and it remained the standard collection of hymnody for the majority of Presbyterians well into the 19th century. In the 19th century, collections of music for congregational singing were often called psalms and hymns. They included a complete or nearly complete collection of metrical psalms and an appendix of hymns. Eventually, the appendix of hymns outweighed the psalms in the books, and so the title was turned around to be Hymns and Psalms. After some time, the metrical psalms were incorporated into the body of hymns included in the book, and if you look at the hymnals throughout the history of the Episcopal Church from 1789 through 1982, you can see this gradual evolution of the psalms and hymns being blended together. Metrical Psalters continued to be published and issued during the early part of the 19th century. However, in 1820, it came to light in the Church of England that they were not legally bound to sing only metrical psalms. As a result, more and more hymns were introduced into congregational singing. By 1875, when Henry W. Baker, editor of the monumental hymnal called Hymns Ancient and Modern, he wrote his hymn, O Praise Ye the Lord, it's based on Psalms 148 and 150. However, it was considered simply a hymn and not necessarily a metrical psalm. Here's what that hymn sounds like. It's one of my favorites. By the late 19th century and early 20th century, it sort of fell out of fashion to write metrical psalms. 
Instead, they would sing the old or the new versions that were already in existence. By the mid 20th century, the liturgical renewal movement had taken off and some hymn writers began to turn to the Psalms to write new metrical texts again. One example of an author who wrote from the Psalms is Timothy Dudley Smith, the Anglican Bishop of Thetford in the Church of England. Hymn number 431 is his setting of Psalm 19 called, The Stars Declare His Glory. Hymn writers in the U.S. also began to turn back toward metrical psalmody in the mid-20th century. Episcopal rector F. Bland Tucker began writing metrical psalms for his congregation in Savannah, Georgia in the 1950s. The hymnal 1982 contains 26 of his hymn texts. Hymn 663 is an example of a psalm paraphrase that he wrote. It's called, The Lord my God, my shepherd is, and it's a paraphrase of Psalm 23. Tucker is a very interesting character in hymnody because not only did he turn to the Psalms, he also turned to other scriptural sources such as the Magnificat and early poetry such as the Gloria in Excelsis that we sing every week. He also turned to writings from the early church, from early saints, their letters that they wrote, their inspiring poems that they wrote and translated those as hymn texts. In fact, he wrote an original hymn text, All Praise to Thee for Thou, O King Divine, or hymn number 477, that we sang this past week in church. One last example of a contemporary hymn writer who turned to the Psalms for inspiration to write a text is Eric Routley. And our hymnal contains his beautiful setting of Psalm 98. This is hymn 413 new songs of celebration render. This hymn is particularly interesting in the context of these videos because we've come full circle. We have a contemporary modern hymn writer who's writing a text to go with a tune written in that Geneva Protestant Reformation era by Louis Bourgeois. I hope you've enjoyed the past couple of weeks as I've discussed Anglican metrical psalms with you. Uh, before we go today, I'm going to be playing Healy Willen's Chorale Prelude on St. Anne, which is based on hymn number 680. And if you are observant, you'll notice the rhythm is slightly different in the, in the chorale prelude versus what we have in the hymnal. I hope you enjoy the piece, and we'll see you soon.
you're evaluating my work. I am. Are you subscribed? I will with a red button. And give us a thumbs up. I'm a fan. Of course.